yes, I, I very much appreciate the invitation from the organizers to come here and visit IGS and be able to tell you something about this work. Um, I don't think the organizers knew about this topic because I hadn't started it but at, the, at the time I got the invitation. So <laughs> it'll be a bit of a surprise. Um, it's a bit intimidating for me in this audience because um, I think about every expert in the world uh, having to do with the initial value problem for the water waves is here. And uh, I don't know anything about that. So there's no dispersive estimates. Um, um, but I have a kind of different point of view on the subject. So it'd be quite different, I think, from a lot of talks in this uh, summer school. Um, but nevertheless, it's, a, I think, a uh, perspective that's interesting. So. Um, yeah, it's really related. I sh really, the title should be talked should be about least action principles, and those things were brought into the subject by Vladimir Arnold in the '60s. And um, really, uh, what I'm doing here is is um, uh, has to do with discussing how uh, least action principles for incompressible flow are related to least action principles that determine uh, optimal transport distances. Uh, and here I'm focusing on a problem involving comparing shapes. And so, um, let's see. I wanted to start with a bit of motivation, or rather a bit of a long prologue, um, just almost just a minute, really to say, I didn't come at this problem by starting to think about water waves. We were thinking really about modeling animal groups, things like swarms and things like that. So the idea there is animals kind of want to maintain a distance between themselves. On a kind of continuum limit level, there's a kind of constant density. And we were interested in various models to do with that, uh, flocking models, gradient flow models. And we we're trying to understand the geometry of configurations like that. So uh, another place where this kind of geometry shows up is in uh, understanding how images deform. Uh, so this goes back way back to work of Darcy Thompson to understand evolution somehow. And, uh, Late, late, lately, since a after Arnold's work on incompressible flow, a uh, subject called computational anatomy arose. And that has to do with putting Riemannian structures on uh, uh, spaces of images, uh, spaces of diffeomorphisms, and uh, trying to understand the geometry that goes on there. So there's, there's kind of a history of work there. My colleague, uh, Dejan Slepchev, actually has a patent to do with implementing these kind of methods to to kind of analyze cancer images. So it's a kind of a, a big subject. OK, so I'll go back. Not, not, assuming not everybody remembers differential geometry, just some elementary things, really. Um, so the length of a path into Riemannian manifold, the met so-called metric on the manifold is an inner product on the tangent space at every point. Uh, so the length of the velocity vector is given by, in terms of that, inner, of, of that metric. And uh, the total length of a path is, is the integral. So Cauchy-Schwartz tells us, uh, OK, the square of the ins thing inside is, is an upper bound for length squared. And uh, this action, if you minimize it, uh, you have to have a constant speed geodesic, a constant speed um, distance minimizing geodesic path. So later, I'll be talking about geodesic paths. These are critical paths for the action. Uh, so the variation of action is 0. but not necessarily distance minimizing. So that's a, a distinction I'll maintain. OK, so least action principles, they go back a long way. Of course, one of the first ones one thinks of is Fermat. So here I'm in just an RD, and there's not really water and air where the light bends going from uh, trying to get from point A to point B in the fastest, fastest time. But uh, really the trivial case in which if you're trying to minimize uh, kinetic energy squared, the action, uh, then particles want to go in a straight line from source to target. So, um, so here we're going to have a continuum. Z is a label for the particles in, the, in, a, in a set in RD. Um, so I think of the, uh, let's see, capital X as a flow map at time t. And um, let's see, so the push forward image, I, I'd like to think of that as the image. So let's see. So Arnold said, well, if we require incompressibility for this flow map, uh, then actually we compute the 
uh, ge geodesic equations, and they actually correspond to incompressible Euler fluid flow. So he's working in a fixed domain for that, typically. Um, but OK, it hardly matters. We'll, we'll well, I, I, I want to do a calculation about this a, a little bit later. Um, so minimizing action then subject to incompressibility is a thing you could try to do to construct solutions. And uh, uh, Jan Brenier, in particular, did a lot of work to try to understand how, that, how, how well that can work. And uh, we'll see some, some vari <coughs> variation of one, of one of his approaches a bit later. Um, but something that turned out to be extremely successful was to drop the incompressibility condition and specify not the, not the positions of all the particles at time 0 and time 1, but the Eulerian densities. Basically, the images of the diffeomorphisms, the shapes. So um, if you specify only that, you end up with something called Wasserstein distance, or mange kantorovich distance, related to, to optimal transportation. And of course, as many people know, this, this, this subject has just burgeoned enormously in the last 20 years. And there are many, many results in this direction. So in a sense, what we wanted to do here was to, to try to impose the endpoint conditions for minimizing action in terms of Eulerian densities, but try to maintain the volume-preserving condition of Arnold. So we should have uh, incompressible flow, and yet um, we won't get the full Euler equation. There will be some kind of extra freedom uh, okay, to do with rearrange, rearranging endpoint, endpoints of particles. It won't matter to me how the particles are arranged as long as the density is the same. Um, the reason for the green dot over here is because somehow all these other cases, okay, they're either trivial or just not much as you, uh, that you can say about them. As, as, uh, what, 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 what in a sense we, we show is, is that uh, the completion of looking at this last, last possibility is, is the Wasserstein distance. And so uh, in, in a, in a in a kind of deep sense, the Wasserstein distance is a kind of the good theory in this, in this setting. OK, so what does Wasserstein distance say? Um, so it's somewhat, of not, not quite the most general form, uh, but you specify two, uh, two, two measures, two, two measures. I'm assuming here they have densities, rho 0 and rho 1. They should have equal total mass uh, because they're gonna, we're, we're going to be transporting with a continuity equation preserving mass. Um, and let's say compact support for convenience. So what that's computed by, according to the result of Benamou and Brenier, is you, you minimize the action, you minimize kinetic energy. According to the Eulerian form, it looks like this, rho v squared, um, where the densities as a path of function of t, they're transported by a continuity equation. You fix the endpoint conditions. And uh, V just has the uh, regularity needed to make the action finite. Um, so they showed that Wasserstein distance is, ca is characterized this way by minimizing kinetic energy. And of course, well, uh, as we'll see in a little, little bit, the density is not constant. It's not, it's not incompressible. Nevertheless, it has a lot of wonderful and amazing properties. One of these is that if you consider uh, measures of constant total mass, uh, supporting a fixed compact set K, the distance you get this way actually metrizes the topology of weak star convergence. Uh, so it's a complete space and uh, you have a lot of nice metric properties. So we're going to try to, to uh, restrict to characteristic function density, right, shapes. So we sh we're only interested in uh, what, what we can see in a sense. And so uh, we'll define, I'll kind of overload the notation. Uh, the induced Wasserstein distance on sets is the corresponding distance between characteristic function densities. And the first uh, qualm you should have about that is that the set of characteristic function densities is not weak star closed. All right, so that's, uh, that's we're going to see that uh, come up again. OK, so one more slide about uh, optimal transport distance. Um, it's very well understood what in, R, in RD, in, in flat space, what the optimal transport paths look like. Uh, the particle paths follow just straight lines. 
there's no incompressibility condition, it's just Fermat. Right? You think things follow straight lines. Um, the extra information, though, that Bernier added to the theory is that, uh, okay, you start at position Z, and you end up at position capital T of Z, this, this, this image map actually turns out to be the gradient of a convex function. Uh, so that's a some consequence of his uh, polar decomposition theorem for, from 25 years ago. And that convex function in, in this case that we're talking about here is unique and characterizes this uh, 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 optimal transport path. Uh, so those are the length minimizing geodesics for um, Wasserstein distance. And I'll drop the length minimizing when I talk about Wasserstein. So that's, those are the important things. So let's see. So the uh, density then is the inverse Jacobian of the flow map. And the velocity straight line transport is, is uh, constant along particle paths. So uh, that means that the system rho v satisfy pressureless Euler equations. So density is transported by continuity. Velocity is advected by, 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 the, by the Eulerian flow. So with no, no, tra no pressure. So here's a little cartoon of what happens when you go from a, uh, what, a, th a short, fat uh, rectangle to a, a tall, narrow one. Uh, it doesn't just rotate. It follows straight line transport from source to target. And uh, in the middle, there's this kind of big rectangle. So you can guess that, OK, a, a density one here and density one here, the total mass is conserved. It'll have to be a small density in the middle. And that's an example of a more general phenomenon, which is that uh, along the particle paths, the mass density is log convex. So it's in particular is convex, and so for my uh, endpoint densities that are characteristic functions, it'll be stuck between 0 and 1. Um, actually, the proof is you don't actually have to compute. It's just you take the log, and uh, minus the log of a linear function is convex. So that's, that's, that's all that's really going on. Um, okay, but those things I'm, I'm, are properties I'm going to be using. So, um, so now the, the distance that we're trying to study is a little more restricted. Okay, so we're looking at action, so you know, Eulerian form like this. Um, and we require that, we have the, that along the path we have, uh, call them shape density, those characteristic functions of, of, of sets that are deforming according to L2 velocity fields. So there's a continuity equation, holds in weak form. And uh, we want to define the shape distance to be in the, the infimum of the action. Uh, so we'll fix the uh, f be initial and final states, source and target, to be characteristic functions. And we were motivated in this by some work of some people in actually in, image in the image processing community uh, who tried a similar idea. Well, so, um, so we've imposed this constraint that, here it is, that the along the path, not just at the beginning and the end, that the density is a characteristic function. And so uh, the admissible set is smaller than it is for Wasserstein distance. So the infimum is going to be no, sm no, no smaller. It'll be, it could be bigger. So that's the first thing we observe. Uh, in Wasserstein distance, the path is free. OK, well, so there's a bunch of natural questions about this then. So, uh, what I want to do is write down the geodesic equations for this for critical paths of this action with this constraint. Um, I'd like to understand, OK, where can we start and end up? Um, what what state, states can be connected by geodesics? Uh, can we say something about this gap between shape distance and Wasserstein distance? Um, that's an infimum. The distance is defined by an infimum. Is it really a minimum, uh, at least locally? And Let's see, and, and somehow, what's the completion of the, of the, of the minimization problem? What's, what's the completion of the topology that the distance provides? OK, so just a sketch of the answers. Uh, well, there would be water wave equations, so there's some nice ones. Um, kind of surprising that essentially any shapes can be connected by geodesics, at least approximately. And I'll, I'll, have to, I'll say what, what that means exactly. Uh, the shape distance turns out exactly equal to Wasserstein distance. There's no gap. Um, length minimizing geodesics al almost, almost never exist for our shape distance. Uh, I think there's, a fun, there's actually a fun problem to try to classify the, this, the, 
ones that, po that can possibly exist. And so that kind of dis is different than in the case of Euler's equation in, the, in a fixed domain. Um, oh, and the completion and relaxation actually is the Benum Bernier form of Wasserstein distance. So in the, somehow in the completion, you lose the incompressibility constraint. And uh, that happens so essentially due to weak star convergence. And we're going to see that quite explicitly in, in the construction. OK, that's uh, sort of right now, that's the kind of end of the prologue. There's a kind of sketch of the things I'm going to really talk about. OK, so uh, I want to go back then and talk uh, about Arnold's characterization and, and really derive the geodesic equations in the context here. OK, so smooth geodesics in the Lie group of diffeomorphisms of a fixed domain uh, correspond to incompressible Euler fluid flows. So that's the incompressible Euler equations. Uh, this is what Arnold showed and what, what we'll see in a minute. Aben and Marston uh, used this to do some analysis <coughs> and some geometry. In particular, they showed a local surjection theorem that, that if uh, you have a diffeomorphism close to the identity in a high Sobolev norm, then there's, uh, there's a geodesic that connects the, in it, uh, connects the identity diffeomorphism to that particular one. So you can rearrange the points basically uh, in, a f in a fixed domain omega using Euler flow as long as the diffeomorphism close to the identity. So there's this local, um, it's kind of a controllability theorem, I guess, almost for <coughs> geodesics. Um, and Brenier st was trying to study um, how you can use least action to construct solutions or generalize solutions in some sense of incompressible Euler. He's got a long series of works on these things. Um, and I'm going to tr try to discuss one version, which involves uh, a kind of mixture of different fluids, uh, which arises in, this, in the context we're, we're, uh, we, we've got here. So we have, in a sense, we have some explicit examples of how the relaxation works. Uh, in, in Euler's, in, in Brenier's work. Okay, so uh, get to business. So they, they want to derive um, the geodesic equations for our shape distance. So <coughs> let's see, so omega t is going to be the image domain uh, under the flow map, capital X, and, and the velocity v is the, just the uh, advected, is the Eulerian flow velocity. Uh, we start with label z and end up with well, uh, there's going to be some target domain omega 1 uh, that I want at the end. Uh, let's see. So we compute variations of the density. So variations, let's see. Find a little, a little chalk. So just sometimes the notion of variation is, is uh, confusing. It's some, 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 some derivative with respect to a supplemental parameter taken at the, at the uh, initial part of some some curve of solutions parameterized by epsilon, say, the variation is just a derivative. So we want to compute the variation of density. So we've got to di differentiate. Well, here I'm differentiating log determinant. So we need the differentiation formula for determinant. Abel's formula involves the trace, the trace of the variation of the matrix times the inverse of the matrix. If I switch back to Eulerian coordinates, that's the Eulerian velocity gradient trace, and that's okay, the divergence of the velocity perturbation. Okay, we're interested in <coughs> motions constrained by being characteristic functions. So um, inside our domain that's evolving, uh, velocity will have zero divergence, and so will the perturbations. Um, but that's not, not true uh, in, the, in the weak sense in our D. It's, uh, we have the continuity equation. OK, so we go ahead and compute the variation of the action. And uh, I basically do it on one slide here. We'll, we'll have Euler's equation at the next line. Um, uh, so I just replace Arnold's uh, Lagrange multiplier by Helmholtz decomposition argument. This is, makes it nice and clean. Let's see, we take the variation of the action, get this quantity, integrate by parts in time, get an endpoint condition here. At time 0, it's, uh, it's fixed. It's delta, z, delta x is 0. So here's the acceleration, the Lagrangian acceleration. Pull back to, to Eulerian coordinates, and that's the Eulerian acceleration. It's dotted with the Eulerian variation of the uh, position. So uh, Eulerian variation of position has got divergence 0. 
And so, uh, let's see. We want to use the held most decomposition. What, L2, just the classic result is that what, L2 of, of a domain is, is a set of, is a gradient of H1 functions on a domain, uh, direct sum with, okay, some space W. So, so this is um, things with zero divergence because they're L2 orthogonal to gradients and they should have zero normal component on the boundary because of integration by parts. And the zero normal component on the boundary is in, I guess, H minus a half, according to classical results in fluid dynamics. Okay, so these are the conditions for the uh, part of, 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 of a vector field U orthogonal to gradients. Our V tilde, uh, we'd like to consider V tildes that have that property. And that means that the acceleration should be a gradient, and that's the basically the result of Arnold. So um, incompressible Euler should, should hold with, zero div uh, with velocity field, zero, zero divergence inside the moving domain. Uh, for us, we actually have a free boundary. So we can consider uh, variations of position that vary the boundary. And that's going to force the pressure to be zero. Uh, that's a, sli a slight white lie. Actually, there's a, the integral of V tilde dot n is constant or it is zero. And so uh, pressure is actually a function of t in the boundary, but I can subtract that off without changing <coughs> it. So pressure is zero on the boundary. And now, as far as, the as far as the endpoint condition at time one is concerned, that's what's gonna give me that velocity is actually a gradient. Uh, so I've got, by, by specifying all the, only the final Eulerian density, only the final shape of the image domain, uh, all I can do is consider uh, variations of velocity that involve the divergence-free part with no normal component on the boundary. So that won't change, variations like that won't change the shapes of the domains. And, uh, uh, but the total action, because of ortho L2 orthogonality, breaks into these two pieces. When I differentiate with respect to the variational parameter epsilon, uh, stationarity tells me that, that w, w is zero. So, uh, so in this context here, uh, the velocity, uh, Eulerian velocity should be potential. We should have potential flow. Um, okay, so in sum, actually these are, these are water wave equations. So uh, velocity is potential flow. Uh, divergence of velocity is zero. So Laplacian holds. And uh, this is the Bernoulli equation you get by integrating up once the uh, Euler equation. <laughs> Uh, for potential flow, and on the boundary, the pressure is zero. So uh, the difference with a, lo uh, a lot of work on Euler is, uh, on water wave equations, is I don't have any gravity. That's just the, I'm, I'm omitting that, that kind of potential force in the problem. Uh, let's see, there's, there's no vorticity. I've got great uh, potential flow, zero pressure, and zero surface tension on the free boundary. Okay, so as I <laughs> All the experts, almost all the experts in the world are on the analysis of the initial value problem right here. Uh, so my understanding, which is very limited, says that uh, basically the, the, the work of Sichue on the, uh, on the uh, water wave problem with gravity, basically this, the same results extend to, to handle this pro problem. Explicitly, the geometry that con that's considered here was handled by Lindblad and later Kutan and Scholar. Um, uh, they included vorticity. So the initial value problem for this is in some sense uh, on the way to being well understood. Um, but I won't need to solve it. I'm interested in this endpoint problem. So uh, I have a family of solutions, though. It's kind of cute. Um, it's straining flow. So I'm meaning along the coordinate axes. Uh, 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 we have we have equations like let's see I think it's I think in my coordinates here it's x j dot is I think it's a j dot over a j x j. Uh, so there's just straining along each of the coordinate axes, and the motion of the uh, we're starting with a ball, and the motion is going to be an ellipsoid. The ellipsoid written in this way, a j as a function of t are just the major axis 
the principal axis uh, radii. Uh, so we, we get these kind of solutions, it turns out, uh, by taking, look at the vector of these radii, these principal axes, and um, look at their product has to be constant because of constant volume. Um, but take any geodesic uh, with respect to the Euclidean metric in RD on that constant volume surface. And that determines a solution of the Euler equations. Uh, so what's nice about that is you can connect any ball to any ellipsoid with the same volume. So no matter how stretched out or whatever. And we're going to make some use of that. So there's the formulas. The um, potential is essentially parabolic. So is the pressure. It vanishes on the boundary. And there's this coefficient beta that comes from, uh, that comes from the, the, the straining rates. Um, I, can't, I refuse to believe that this, is, this solution is less than 200 years old, uh, but I haven't found it in the literature yet. <laughs> I think it must be related to Jac Jacobi's uh, self-gravitating fluid ellipsoids in some limit, but I, I haven't looked, at it, looked for it yet. Um, so these Euler droplets, they have uh, a nice property of being nested inside Wasserstein ellipsoids. Um, so starting from, so in, in, in orange here are the sort of particle paths of Wasserstein uh, geodesics that connect a ball to an ellipsoid. And uh, in blue are the, is the Euler droplet. So what, what's responsible for this is that the principal axis lengths turn out to be convex. And uh, for the Euler droplets, and for Wasserstein ellipsoids, they're straight lines. Everything moves in straight lines. So the Euler droplet is inside. It's not very much inside. But I, this is about as far as I can get it inside. Uh, but it's inside. <laughs> I'm going I'm to use this. So uh, now I can say what an Euler spray is. It's uh, some kind of countable disjoint superposition of droplets like this. So I'm going to have an infinite number of them. And we're going to build some interesting solutions out of that. OK, so here's the result. Uh, take okay, two, opens, uh, two open sets, two bounded open sets in Rd with equal volume. Then uh, there's an Euler spray, which connects the, um, a source, which is, let's see, up to a set of, me up to a set of measure 0, it agrees with omega 0. And there's a target which, in transport distance, is very close to the, uh, the desired target omega 1. So uh, it's L infinity of Wasserstein distance. It means there's a map from omega 1 epsilon to omega 1, which moves every point by distance no more than epsilon. So it's, uh, it's close in, in just in, in, in the sense of displacement. And the action of the spray, the total action of the spray, of course, the uh, let's see, this is the shape distance I defined as the infimum over paths connecting omega 0 epsilon to omega 1 epsilon. Of course, the ac actual action is no, no uh, smaller than that. But it's as close as you like to the Wasserstein distance between omega 0 and omega 1. Um, so this tells us somehow that, OK, these Euler sprays are, in some sense, geodesics. They're critical paths of the action. And you can find uh, you can find a lot of them. You can f there's, there's somehow everywhere in this in this space of shapes, everywhere dense in this space of shapes. Uh, what this estimate says, actually, if you think about the completion, is the following. So uh, by so by approximating omega one, uh, better and better by. Uh, a sequence of sets, basically, a s that, that uh, better and better approximate omega 1, I can concatenate those paths and get, and get an exact connection, not a geodesic connection, but an exact connection between omega 0 and omega 1. And I find out that the, uh, I that the infimum of paths connecting omega 0 and omega 1 is Wasserstein distance. So there's no gap. So uh, let's see. So what else can we say? Oh, yeah, so now how, how do we construct these Euler sprays? So here we actually use um, a pretty powerful theorem about uh, partial regularity of the Wasserstein uh, 
uh, optimal, transport, <coughs> optimal transport map that originates in work of Caffarelli and later Figali and Kim. Uh, so what it says in our, in our present context where we have the density that's one inside, inside this, the open set omega zero, um, the optimal transport map is smooth on a, f uh, a dense open set of full measure, omega zero hat. So there's infinite regularity there. And so um, okay, we'll see an example in a second of how it can fail to be smooth everywhere. Um, in, this, in some sense, it's, 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 it's not hard. I'm, I'm not, there's, no con there's no hypothesis of connectedness here. Uh, there's transport can, can rip the set in, in, in pieces. So um, there's no reason that the transport map should be continuous. Um, but you have this partial regularity. So in the, in the, in the smooth set, we're going to use it. We're going to construct a Vitali covering by disjoint balls uh, with radii that are, that are chosen in a nice way that controls error accumulation in, in the in the total um, in the total action. Uh, so that I won't write down. It's, I can't do that in public. So it's just in that looks like a mess. Um, and what we do is we're going to 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 only have to deal with um, ellipsoidal solutions. So these are somehow uh, uh, the transport maps are linear, and so uh, they'll only approximate the Wasserstein transport map uh, locally. Uh, we're gonna we need to spread out slightly by an epsilon uh, the centers of the of the target balls, the centers of the targets, to make a little bit of room so that the to make things not overlap. Uh, so let's see for the actual uh, Brenier map T, that's injective. There's no overlapping of, of images uh, anywhere along the, along the opt Wasserstein optimal transport path. Uh, but be, we're making this ellipsoidal approximation. We want to eliminate overlap. We just need an epsilon of room. And so we get the list, this little bit of room for these um, transported ellipsoids. They're linear approximations of the transport map. And there's just a little bit of room. There's a countable number of these balls, though, remember, so the boundary is pretty, pretty quite a mess. <laughs> uh, so the Euler, Euler droplets, though, are nested inside the ellipsoids that you get this way. These are just, um, let's see, you do linear interpolation here. So each little ball is transported according to the Wasserstein ellipsoid. Uh, OK, for the whole collection, I don't know what the op optimal Wasserstein map is, uh, but this is, this is close enough. For, for approximation. Uh, so our Euler droplets at the end, we have a countable number of them, but we can, can, can control them and, and not to collide. And so they superimpose and provide a solution of the, uh, geod well, sort of an action critical path, a geodesic. OK, so this is a bit of an illustration of a computation. It's not quite with the Euler spray construction I described here, but it's the only illustration I have at the moment. But it il illustrates how you divide up the source domain into little balls. So the, in, 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 the, in the proof, the balls are going to be a lot smaller and many more of them. Um, along the way, there's going to be a little room bet between them. These surely should, should be ellipsoids, but in this computation, they weren't. Uh, what this computation indicates here over here on the right is the image, images of the balls under the actual Wasserstein map. So uh, those, get, those get approximated by ellipsoids and spread out a little bit in the proof. Uh, so over here, you can see that there's two balls touching over here, orange and yellow. And over here, uh, the computed Wasserstein map has this cut along the inside. So you can see it's not necessarily uh, smooth, even in the case of connectedness. OK, so that's a kind of illustration of what's, uh, what's, what's supposed to be happening here. Let's see, how am I doing with time? Less than 10 minutes. Um, yeah. Let's see, so the, let's see, so the, um, the Euler sprays we get, so they're weak solutions of a uh, of Euler equation, and uh, written in terms of the density and momentum conservation laws, we can think of them as weak solutions of an equation like this. They, they have this pressure that comes from the, uh, the formula we, formulas uh, we, we, sh we wrote down before. Um, 
let's see, the, the divergence, of, of, divergence of velocity, as remember, is not zero in the weak sense, but the, the constraint really is that the density is this characteristic function. So that's the constraint that, uh, that determines the pressure in a sense in this, in this problem here. So what's happening to the, um, as epsilon goes to zero in the previous theorem, is the weak solutions you get from, from comp incompressible Euler here are converging in a weak sense to solutions of the pressureless Euler system here. The pressure is actually going to zero uniformly. Um, and the other ones, they converge in, in the weak star sense. Uh, it, looks, it looks fancier than it is. It it's just really has to do with the effective gaps between the between the, between the uh, ellipsoids uh, for time between 0 and 1. Um, the average density goes to the limiting, uh, limiting row, which typically is going to be less than 1. Um, and the other weak convergences are kind of a very similar, similar fashion. So the only kind of non-trivial estimate here is the pressure estimate. I don't know if I quite have time to talk about it. Uh, I think I probably won't go through it in detail. Um, but I will say that it has to do with um, that vector of the estimate. It doesn't, does use the uh, choice of the choice of those major axes, the principal axes, as uh, length minimizing geodesics on that uh, constant volume surface. So what we do is we take the <coughs> Wasserstein uh, linear interpolant between the original, the ball of original radius r, and the final ball with, with um, principal axis length a j hat. So that, that linear interpolant you project onto the constant volume manifold and use that as an upper bound for the um, length minimizing geodesic length. Okay, and a couple of uh, geometric factors uh, end up with a bound like this. So we choose our Vitali uh, covering to make sure that everything comes out less than accumulates to something less than epsilon. OK, so um, actually, I'm kind of okay, fairly close to the end then. So, um, so we have this minimization problem that we, we were trying to solve. I try to minimize action to construct solutions of incompressible Euler. And we see that uh, actually there's this instability due to micro droplet formation. Um, so in fact, typically no length minimizing path exists. Um, and that has to do with the uniqueness of Wasserstein geodesics. So actually necessary and sufficient for a length minimizing path with shape densities everywhere along the path, characteristic functions everywhere along the path, is that the Wasserstein geodesic has to have sh characteristic function densities. So way back where, way back when, Yeah, over here. Uh, that said, rho had to be identically one inside the domains. So all the eigenvalues of the of the Hessian of the convex function have to be one. The convex function has to be the identity essentially, locally. Well, some translate of the identity. Um, so what possi what possibilities are there? Uh, so kind of locally, you have to have rigid body motion on components of the smooth set. Okay, how, what kind of ways can you break up a domain into piece, pieces of rigid bodies flying apart? I don't want to make the experiment, but um, it's, um, it's, it seems an interesting possi uh, problem, actually. There could be a lot of interesting structure there. Um, so we've seen that Euler sprays exist approximately transporting a bounded open set to a, another one of equal volume. If you consider uh, weak limits of the co corresponding Euler solutions, um, you get the optimal transport flows, the Wasserstein geodesics, uh, which have density going between 0 and 1. I have this little picture here, which um, I was trying to think of an artist right, that uh, used this pixelation. I think there was an earlier French one, Seurat. Right? <laughs> pixelation. Uh, and, and the idea is, uh, in a lot of uh, geometric analyses of shape deformations, everything's assumed to be smooth. And of course, I have the op opposite here. I have the things fragmented in a very bad way. 
Um, okay, but I'd like to argue that, uh, okay, modern digital technology uh, with uh, ink drop printing and 3D printing, <laughs> really one should be able to think about mic micro droplet, uh, building up images out of micro droplets. And so maybe this has some relevance, you know. Um, yeah, so the last, uh, last issue has to do with how this connects with Bernie's work on relaxations of uh, least action principles for incompressible flows. Um, I don't have a lot to say about that. There's a, it's a, there's, there's, there's a lot of interesting uh, wor uh, work on this subject. Um, but my goal here is basically to describe a, a well-posed relaxation or completion of the least action principle in, uh, a, natu in a natural way. And uh, something that Bernie didn't really consider was what happens when you have variable density. So that's what we're going to have here. We're going to have two fluids with different densities, rho 1 hat and rho 0 hat. And the interesting case is actually when rho 0 is 0. Uh, so Bernier's key argument, key, key, the key uh, element in Bernier's work is the observation that kinetic energy is convex in mass and momentum considered jointly. And so let's see, where's mass and momentum? There's uh, mass is basically rho hat c, that's density, and momentum is m. M is, m is down here somewhere. m is rho hat c times v, so that's the momentum. So that's a convex function of both variables. And uh, okay, so using convex analysis, you can write this function as an indicator function of a certain set, parabolic set. <coughs> and okay, it's a supremum of affine functions, so it's convex. And this is the one that one ends up using uh, to construct the relaxation. So what's a relaxation? It should be something, you should be thinking about the closure in the weak star topology. And so uh, that's why we're going to have densities that can, can, that can be between 0 and 1. So Ci is a concentration. You should think of it as between 0 and 1. In the, in the uh, least action problem here, you don't necessarily constrain it, but uh, I will in a second. So the kinetic energy of the mixture is is uh, the sum of the kinetic energy of the components. We have two fluids. They basically occupy more or less, at the macroscopic level, they occupy the same space. At the microscopic level, who knows? Uh, and you, the object is to minimize that kinetic energy, infamize it over uh, subject to incompressibility constraints. So the sum of the concentration should be one. Transport of each, co each component separately with conserved total mass and uh, endpoint conditions, which here I'm taking as characteristic functions. Uh, so the kind of solutions I was looking for all along, actually the concentrations are characteristic functions for all time. Uh, but whether you can actually minimize and, get and preserve that property in the limit, you don't know. But the point is that this kind of formulation does have an infimum. It uh, does have a minimum, rather. So you can minimize in this framework. So you have a relaxation, a kind of completion of the least action principle. Um, and in fact, when you have fluid vacuum mixture, this connects our incompressible, uh, incompressible constrained problem to explicitly to Wasserstein. So we can say that um, the relaxed least action problem uh, actually has a unique solution uh, given by the, uh, the Wasserstein geodesic flow, the pressureless Euler flow com coming from the Wasserstein geodesic. Uh, a minimizing family of the unmixed paths, so where the, the CJs are given by characteristic functions, is provided by, well, concatenated Euler sprays. And uh, so that's a kind of explicit connection of the, inc the, the geodesics from, uh, in, in with the incompressibility constraint, uh, looking at it from the point of view of really trying to relax the least action problem to something that has a minimizer. The minimi minimization is, is actually given by the Wasserstein GDZ. OK, so that's the end. Let's see. So, so, so those are some of the same things I said. Um, we've added here the relaxed least action problem, naturally related to work of Bernier. There's a preprint online, um, which is being heavily revised at the moment. We've got substantially simplified proofs. 
So we, we expect within a month or so to have a, a better version uh, for you to read. Uh, thanks for your attention. So do, do you get something better, like if you start with uh, two densities rather than the... Oh, interesting. Uh, so um, I didn't know a lot about this problem of, uh, where did it go, of uh, the mixture problem with, with two densities, uh, but I've Actually, I heard recently a talk by a student of uh, Barbara Kiefitz. It seems that uh, this problem with two densities is actually connected to it's a problem with singular shocks. And non a non-hyperbolic system that has singular shocks. So uh, it's, it's really the same in thing. In the case of characteristic function, you have a lot of possibilities, like, but if you start with two densities, um, I mean, you have less room. I mean, you have it's oh, in terms of, of moving things around and, and, and constructing some analog of unmixed paths, yeah, I ha actually, I have no idea. Yeah, how you would move things around to make room and... So these are, there's a little bit connected with Bresson's conjectures about... <laughs> they're really tough problems. But for the mixture theory itself, is connected with this non-hyperbolic system with singular shocks.